But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Daniel 12.4, one of the most significant and one of the most overlooked prophecies of the Bible. It speaks of a very unique time in history, a time just before the end of history, that sees a dramatic increase in speed and knowledge. I'm Anthony Cheatham, part of the Jack Van Impe research team, and you're about to discover that we are indeed living in that fast-paced and foreseen time. So get ready to take a new look at your world and your future. 2,500 years ago, the prophet Daniel foresaw a generation where knowledge would suddenly and explosively increase. Today, Jack Van Impe Presents analyzes Daniel's prophecy in the light of our ever-changing world. The information age is definitely upon us, and Dr. Jack and Rexella Van Impe have gathered news reports from around the globe to discover if we are living in the end times, times that would see an increase in knowledge and ultimately the return of Jesus Christ. There is no doubt that this generation right now has more knowledge than any other in history. Well, of course, this makes sense, since it is true that every generation does gain from the advancements that were made before it. However, what we've discovered in this generation is a dramatic, even explosive increase in knowledge. That is what makes this time in history so unique and so significant. You know, Jack, such an explosion of information. Have you ever seen anything like it? The explosion of information. Well, here is the, the cover of the Futures magazine, Information Explosion. Is it a boon or a bane? From the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, I have learned this. They have to print a volume of newly accumulated information every year. A whole volume. And now, with the world's access to the Internet and the proliferation of home pages, information is updated by online sources daily, even hourly. In some cases, I know on our uh, home page, the World Wide Web, we update ours every single day, don't we, Jack? And here's the reason why. In Daniel 12, 4, God says to the prophet, Daniel, seal the book. Shut it up until the time of the end. How will we know when is the time of the end? He said, many shall run to and fro worldwide travel and knowledge shall be increased. Last year, 50 million people flew over the Atlantic Ocean to go to Europe. Not only that, but from the year 1 to 1750, knowledge doubled. Now it doubles every 22 months. But there's more, the technological explosion that allows us to get the message to all the world via television every week. How's that tie in? Matthew 24, 14. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. End of what? This age of grace that goes into the age of the kingdom. That's why they're preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. The king's about to return. And he comes as king of kings and lord of lords in Revelation 19, 16 to rule and reign for a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 4. Now, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's take a look at exactly how far we've come. When caught in a whirlwind of change like our world is now, it's easy to miss the milestones and landmarks. The jump from horse and buggy to rockets and space shuttles was extremely quick, and many might have missed it. There are many, many signs that God gave to us in the Bible that we could sort of be looking for just prior to the return of the Lord. Well, um, this is one of the signs. Who can forget Henry Ford's inventions? Well, this, this is one of them. Here he is in one of his early vehicles. And now, friends, look how far we have come. Uh, Jordan's desert calm is shattered by speedsters. Well, the British Air Force pilot Andy Green will attempt to break the world land speed record and soon the sound barrier in a car over in, in Jordan. It's going to be quite an exciting time. We've come a long way from that first vehicle to where we are right now, Jack. And is that one of the signs? Yes, and I want to emphasize something. People said we've always had signs, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, etc. But that's not what the Bible says. It says in Matthew 24, 33, when you shall see all the signs happening in relationship to Israel becoming a nation. 1948, Matthew 24, 32. 
and Jerusalem being captured by the Jews, Luke 21, 24. Then, when all these things happen in connection with these two great events, you know my coming is near, even at the door. So every sign is here, Rexella. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of the tremendous things the rabbis proposed for the coming of Messiah. And it couldn't have been in Henry Ford's day for a simple reason, the word speed. Watch this. You know, before Ford came, all they could say to a horse was, giddy up. <laughs> and then his little Model A, Model T was going 25 miles an hour, and now Breedloff broke the record at the Bonneville Salt Flats at 600 miles an hour, and now they're going to try to break the sound barrier with that car in the Jordan area right near Jerusalem. What's the sign? Nahum chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The chariot shall be with flaming torches in the day of Messiah's preparation when Christ is going to return. The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broadways. Accents, they shall seem like torches, headlights and taillights. And here it is. They shall run like the lightning. Speed. Even that sign was not able to be fulfilled at the time of Henry Ford, but it is now. Science fiction, in many cases, it seems, is quickly becoming science fact. This was bound to happen at some point in history. But what is remarkable is the speed at which it is now occurring. The Van Impes spoke earlier about the increase in air travel. Let's see what may be landing in your airport in the very near future. This is the revolutionary machine the Russians believe will transform the whole future of air travel. It's called the Akeep. It certainly looks like a flying saucer, and the prototype of it is being built here in the city of Saratov, in what was once one of the most secret defense plants in Russia. We've obtained these computerized design plans, which show the Akeep is almost all fuselage. Ultimately, the Russians say it could carry far more passengers than the biggest jumbo jet, with room for two and a half thousand people. Once it was thought an aircraft this shape could never fly, but after testing models, the Akeep's creators say they've made a breakthrough in aerodynamic design, though they're keeping it a closely guarded secret. These tests might not inspire much confidence in potential passengers, already shaken by recent disasters on conventional Aeroflot planes. Yet the Russians say the Akeep could be in full production within three years. It's still early days, but they believe that by the next century we could all be traveling like this, and that ordinary jet airliners could be consigned to history. The Akeep may not be able to fly to other planets, but its designers say it will be capable of taking off and landing on water, or virtually any flat surface. The idea is that it won't be restricted to using airports, but it could pick up and deliver cargo, for example, almost anywhere in the world. But the Russians are worried their Western competitors like Boeing may also be trying to develop this sort of flying saucer as a commercial aircraft. And so the race is on to get there first. This might look like something out of a science fiction fantasy, but the Russians believe it represents a real breakthrough in aerospace engineering. And they're hoping that if they can successfully develop this prototype and sell it around the world, then it'll earn them valuable hard currency income. Ben Brown, BBC News, Saratov. Now in the past, there may have been a great deal of fear and protest about such new technologies, but not today. Our generation accepts, even yearns for change. Robert F. Kennedy may have been speaking for this newest generation when he said, some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. Just think of how far we've come from when Lord Kelvin said at the turn of the century, heavier-than-air flying machines are impossible. I think the transition um, to that kind of technology and, uh, and people's reluctance to adopt new technologies is diminishing over time. I mean, it pervades everything that they do, and it, this would just be one more aspect of the information age that becomes part of their everyday life. You know, the question, what does the future hold? For, um, for, for this technology really should be couched in, in a broader term. What does the future hold for, for society? Because the technology is part of society. It's a component part. It's a major influence. It's a driving force in many ways, economically, and I suppose now socially and culturally, whether you approve or disapprove is, is immaterial. There is no stopping the hands of time. And with the ever-increasing speed of life today, they really do seem to be going even faster. Charles F. Kettering wisely wrote, 
that we should all be concerned about the future because we will have to spend the rest of our lives there. For another look at our ever-changing world and our future, here are Dr. Jack and Rexella Van Impey. Well, here's an interesting article uh, ha having to do with telecommunications. Global telephone deal is completed, Washington. An agreement on Saturday to open the $600 billion global telephone market to increase competition should produce more than $1 trillion in benefits to consumers from Bombay to Buffalo in providing lower rates and better service. What do you think about that, Jack? Well, you know, when the Antichrist comes to power, and we've just shown you that it's all so possible now, he has global control. The Bible says in Daniel 7.23 that he devours the whole world, and here we have global communications through telephone, and that also means that we're approaching the time of the end. Why? In Daniel 12, verse 4, it says, Daniel, shut up this book, close it, seal it, until the time of the end. And how will we know when the time of the end is near? He said, knowledge shall be increased. Do you know that 25 years ago, Rexella, we only made 900,000 calls annually overseas. And that has jumped in 1996 to 191 million calls. And now they're going global. It's part of this package of a global ruler. This one we call the infamous Antichrist. Yeah, well, there's more on that, Jack. For all you ladies who like to shop till you drop, you may have to do it in a different way. Listen to this. Appearing soon on a computer near you. The United States is at the moment in the midst of a telecommunications revolution that will fundamentally change retailing, education, and the way we organize and control our business. Within 10 years, we will have all of the technologies to close every store in the country and buy everything electronically. Oh. Oh, man, <laughs> Rexella, they'll have the ability to close every store in the world because of the technology, computers, and everybody can do everything electronically. This world leader comes to power in Revelation 13, 1. He has power over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nations, verse 7. All the world worships him, verse 8. And verse 16 tells the story about controlling that electronic electronically. <laughs> we don't have to do something that's far-fetched anymore. It's right here before us. You are hearing the headlines of the hour. Think of it. Every store could be closed in 10 years and everything could be done electronically. The Mall of America in Bloomington, Minnesota. It's billed as the largest mall with 450 stores and shops. Tour groups come from all over the world just to see this place. Thousands of visitors every day. But now, there's a new mall in America, and it's bigger, with more visitors. America's Choice Mall, from Guthy Ranker Internet. Shoppers also come here from all over the world, but they come by computer, via the Internet. Thousands of visitors come every day to browse the more than 800 retailers featured in the mall. Large stores, like Neiman Marcus, are here, but there are also small specialty shops, offering items you will not probably find in your local mall like this doll made from cloth that you supply. It can match curtains in a room or your child's favorite clothes. I can find a lot of things on the America's Choice Mall that I couldn't find in a regular mall. They had some books that I've never seen in a regular bookstore. They had this uh, clothing store, like this consignment type clothing store. You don't see that in a regular mall. You have to go search those out. I don't have time to, you know, to go out to the malls and, and go places, but I can just sit here and, and surf through the net and find it whenever I want. It's point and click. You just see what you want to get, you click on it, and you enter your information and then, you know, you have it. It's done. What can be more convenient than not leaving your own bedroom <laughs> where your computer is? You just get up and turn the computer on and that's very convenient. You don't even have to, you know, put your makeup on and get dressed and go out of the house. First of all, there's no parking problems because you're not actually going anywhere. You're sitting at your computer and you can move from location to location, go from store to store, look at different items of merchandise, and you're all, still, again, you're sitting in one place. I don't have time to go shopping. A friend of mine had a birthday coming up, and I knew he wanted a particular brand of sunglasses. I looked them up, uh, found them on the internet, ordered them, and had them within two days, and they were cheaper. 
it's much less exhausting. When I go to the mall and I come home, I'm always completely exhausted. <laughs> Even if I was only there for half an hour, it's like you're tired from walking around from store to store. So this is a lot more relaxing. Well, actually, the internet is very, very secure. It's more secure than most forms of transactions. As a matter of fact, it's more secure than going to a restaurant and leaving your card with a waiter or uh, ordering and giving your credit card uh, via mail order. Because basically, Netscape and Microsoft use encryption technology that allows uh, people to send secure transactions over the internet, totally safe, uh, and uh, works real well. Just to give you an idea of how incredible this technology is and how quickly it has come upon us, Consider this quote from the president, chairman, and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, Ken Olson. He said in 1977 that there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. That was the top man at a cutting-edge company in 1977. Knowledge certainly has increased. I think you're going to see dramatic changes um, in the next five years. Uh, banking technologies are going to be driven more towards the home. Um, I, it's far from a stretch to, to say that you'll be able to do, I'd say 90, 95, maybe 100% of, of your everyday over-the-counter transactions from a personal computer or perhaps even from your TV screen. Uh, those kind of technologies are in development today. They're being piloted by uh, a number of the banks um, and other institutions. You'll be able to pay your hydro bills and order television subscriptions and things like that um, as easily you know as you pick up a phone. We have statistics that show uh, computer capability from the sense of the computer chips themselves are able to run uh, two to four times faster every 18 months. So 18 months from now the computers that will be coming out, the newest processors will be running again, two to four times faster than the ones we have today, at the same cost. I would venture to say in the next 10, 15, 20 years, which to us isn't a great deal of time, you know, um, uh, is going to see an amazing evolution in the, in the physical structure of the home. Uh, and 15 to 20 years in, in, in terms of technological development, Wow, that's, that's an eon. Gosh, the, the, what's going to happen in that period of time um, is anyone's guess. About this matter of the expansion of human knowledge, knowledge shall be increased. Oh, is that an index of today. From the time of Christ until 1750, knowledge, the amount of things we know, doubled one time. From 1750 to 1900, it doubled again. From 1900 to 1950, doubled again. From 50 to 60, doubled again. And now, the expansion of human knowledge, the things that we know, are going up at an exponential rate. So it's really almost straight up. And of course, the name of the game is computers, cybernetics. Information flow is probably at its height. Not that it's at its limit or at its maximum, but certainly, historically, information flow today is, has far greater accessibility than ever before. Um, a simple thing like, I'm flying out to Vancouver, it's a Wednesday afternoon, I'm going to be there Thursday, I need a hotel reservation, I need to rent a car, I need to know what street I can go to a McDonald's on, or where can I stay because I'd like to stay downtown core. Um, I go to the internet, I sit down, I type in Vancouver, I identify hotels, I find my hotel, I get a map of the city, I find out what's happening. All this information in a half hour's time, I haven't made a single phone call. And now I know exactly where I'm going. Really, anything that you want to know is accessible if you know where to find it. Where information technology is already entrenched, which is a, a, a good portion of the developing nations, you see that we are living in a global information economy, that all kinds of transactions are happening on a global level. The internet is global. There are no borders when you're talking about electronic transmission. It is impossible to enforce borders. Of course, with every new invention, others quickly become possible. The first computers have given way to smaller, faster, and better computers, and so on and so on. It is a well-known fact that by the time someone buys the newest and most up-to-date piece of technology from a store, it is usually already obsolete. 
The Van Impies again can give us a clue as to how fast things really are moving. Astronauts are not only looking into the heavens, but they are listening for what's out in space. This is from the World and I Project Phoenix. Boasts a receiver capable of listening to 28 million channels simultaneously. 28 million channels. Well, there's something even mm. bigger out there. A billion channel ears tuned to the aliens. Huh. This is from Harvard. <clears throat> Scientists have developed quite an ear for the extraterrestrials, an 84-foot radio telescope with a billion, I said it, billion channels tuned to finding intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. About 250 uh, physicists, astronomers, and curious stargazers from Harvard University and beyond gathered money to watch and listen as one of the Earth's largest receivers was turned on. So uh, we're not waiting to see if this is going to happen. It is happening. Now we have a billion channels. Now, Rexel, they just discovered or created a new reconnaissance plane that will go 45,000 feet in the air, nine miles up, and it, it can pick up the view of a basketball on the ground Whoa. as it flies. Mm. None of that, the newest computers, get ready for shock, will now produce one trillion calculations per second. There are five billion of us. That means that every second they can get 200 pieces of information on every human being on the earth. And the Antichrist is coming. And he is Satan in human flesh. And he will have a system by which he controls people. What exactly is possible with these supercomputers? Are they just souped up calculators or incredibly advanced video games? Or are they now much, much more? At Cambridge University, Simon Crosby is in his final year studying for a doctorate degree in computing. But last year, his hands and fingers seized up. After years of touch typing, often for 12 hours a day, five or six days a week, he developed repetitive strain injury. It was devastating. Um, I sat for five months getting more and more depressed and really just needed to get on and get finished. And you were in pain? Yes, almost all the time. Today, Simon is back completing his PhD thesis using a computer which he talks to. Dear John, comma, new paragraph, thanks for your letter of... The voice recognition computer frees him from the keyboard. He can now work nearly as fast as he used to. In fact, for some commands, it's much quicker to give them to the computer by voice than via the keyboard. Experts say that as computer power increases, computers will be able to recognize continuous speech with no need to speak with gaps between the words. It's a total revolution. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, we've been stuck with the keyboard design uh, for the wrong reasons. Um, we now have a solution to that problem. According to the experts, in four or five years, all new computers will be able to recognize voice commands and the old-fashioned keyboard will eventually become obsolete. I think that just as Arthur C. Clarke in 2001 anticipated we'd be talking to hell, uh, and in Star Trek they talk to computers, I think uh, in another 10 years it'll be very common to uh, talk to computers. Perhaps a professor could use your computer. Please. Computer? Computer? Hello, computer. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard. How quaint. This is bleeding edge stuff. This is release one of what you see on Star Trek. It really is. Analysts say there's a lot at stake with voice recognition. We're headed toward uh, um, a time when people will use uh, speech to interact with computers almost exclusively and I think the keyboard will join the slide rule in the Smithsonian Institution and uh, as something that we consider quaint. Technology is sexy. That's what it comes down to. Technology is newsworthy. We all want to live in the future. We're all afraid of living in the present or we're bored of it. I mean, I'm driving a car. Whenever you drive, when I drive my car, I always think about, wow, I, there's no horse in front, nothing's pushing me behind, there's only this liquid that fuels it up, but we take it so much for granted. That's human nature. 
The fact is that we're always looking to the future. That's human nature too. We're always expanding our horizons. We're always frontiering and pioneering into possibilities, into the outer limits. On the cover of Time magazine, we can see something else. Can machines think? They already do, say scientists. So what if anything is special about the human mind? Well, uh, from Time magazine, the race to build intelligent machines is going on. They are really thinking that these machines are like human beings. Dr. Rorvik, a generation says this, a generation of robots is rapidly evolving, a breed that can see read, talk, learn, and even feel emotions. And this is from the Knight Ritter's newspaper service. British physicist Stephen Hawking says, we've created life in our own image. Computer viruses are alive. I think computer viruses should be counted as life, said Hawking, the giga genius whose book, A Brief History of Time, put him in maybe second place behind Albert Einstein in the Deep Thinker's Hall of Fame. So he is thinking that actually what we've created is like life. Computer now, Jack, viruses. I have a question about life. this, though. Yes. Is this in um, agreement with what the Bible teaches? The prophet Daniel, in chapter 11, verse 21, and chapter 12, verse 11, spoke about the abomination that makes desolate. And he was talking about a time when an image would be set up in the Jewish temple. And in history, Antiochus Epiphanes marched into Jerusalem, set up this image in honor of the god Zeus, the one we just honored at the Olympics last year, and put a pig on the altar. And because of it, desolated that holy place. So it was called the abomination that makes the holy temple desolate. When Jesus quoted Daniel, he wasn't thinking about that time because it had already happened. But in Matthew 24, 15 and Mark 13, 14, he says, uh, you remember what the prophet Daniel had to say? And he said, when you see this abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. And what is this image that's going to stand in the temple in the last days? Well, this image is found in many parts of the Bible. And you can see it in Revelation 13, verses 14 and 15, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9, 11, 15, verse 2, 16, verse 2, and 19, verse 20. But let's go back to the main text, chapter 13, verse 15. It says, He had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Many think this could be an image in the form of a computer that has life. And here is Hawking, this man who's compared to the, being the second Einstein of history, saying that computer viruses are alive. When talking about the possibility of thinking and living computers, most people envision robots. And the field of robotics has become very advanced. However, most of the major breakthroughs in creating lifelike computer technology have been in the field of virtual reality. Computer programs can now create any structure, any fantasy, and any body in a virtual world that anyone can enter. Virtual reality is so called because its images seem almost real, and in some cases, even better than real. Basically, virtual reality is a technology that allows you to interact with computer-generated worlds. It, it sort of toys with your senses to allow you to think that a world that's not real really is and it immerses you in the technology, meaning that the rest of the world is shut off and you are completely involved in this new computer-generated environment. Virtual reality for engineering design of aircraft, automobile and industrial plants, for training maintenance workers, dismounted infantry and handicapped students, for promoting new pharmaceuticals, kitchen appliances and residential houses. This is professional virtual reality from Division. These are real applications, not future fantasies, solving problems for industry, defense, education, and science. Virtual reality is still a developing technology, but it has already impressed the skeptics. And with computer power increasing exponentially, the future of VR is bright and the possibilities are endless. The Royal College of Art is a proving ground for designers, a place for students to catch the eye and shine. Whether your dress is held up by helium balloons or you prefer more formal wear, there's no end to the possibilities. 
As fashions in clothes change, so do fashions in models. Today's crop are more willowy than ever, but not yet as skeletal as this one. This plastic model could revolutionize the fashion world. Its limb movements are being transferred to a computer. The aim, to build up a virtual reality mannequin, to wear clothes designed and made up on a computer. On the screen, the skeleton can be made to walk. The movements of neck and stomach muscles can be simulated, as can the way textiles move and change shape. Put all the elements together and you have a virtual reality catwalk. Ultimately, we would like to, to give a 3D software package tool to a fashion designer who will then be able to actually simulate clothing prior to manufacture to reduce some of the, um, the amount of time it takes in discussing a garment before it's made up in the real world. Some designers already make use of computers to design fabrics. I think the catwalk show is the most, you know, it's amazing because it's there in front of you. But I think virtual reality is, it could be the future of things, yeah, definitely. It could help you a lot. Yeah, definitely. Ultimately, shoppers might be able to dial up a virtual reality model, feed in their own measurements and dress the model in clothes from a library of designs, all on a computer. But some things even a computer might balk at. Shoes that put a spring in your step. Clothes with a built-in aqualung. Or the ultimate in zip-up Yashmax. James Wilkinson, BBC News. With all of our recent advancements, it would be tempting to think that we've reached our limits. But remember that throughout history, others have felt the same way and have always been proven wrong. For example, Charles H. Duell, the commissioner of the U.S. Office of Patents, said in 1899 that everything that can be invented has been invented. Limitations? When you talk to somebody like me, I know nothing about limitations. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this business. The limitations of virtual reality today are embedded in technology, our access to technology, our ability to perform certain software functions, but most importantly, the available capital by which to explore these areas. Certainly, capital financial considerations have been our foremost limitation in doing what we want to do. There has never been a time where, someone, where we have had an abundance of money and said, no, sorry, we can't do this. Um, I don't know how many millions and millions and millions of dollars I could go through before I say, I've hit my limits. But that's the beautiful thing about technology and virtual reality and where we are. The idea is, is that there are no limitations. And it is and if we were to think that there were limitations, we wouldn't be where we are today, technologically speaking. For all of our increased knowledge and enthusiasm, though, there are still problems. Often it seems that we're blasting ahead without reading the directions. Yet, still, despite the warning signals, we continue on. Something very scary and shaky is going to happen. The Millennium Bug looms. The PCs will freak on January 1st, 2000. Is a fix in the making? Everyone is very worried about this, friends. Listen to this from Newsweek. By now you've probably heard about the Millennium Bug, the potential worldwide computer meltdown that could, the experts say, all but paralyze the planet come January 1st. Uh, this too. Efforts lag to fix U.S. computers by 2000. The millennium is about three years away, but concern is mounting that's not enough time for computer wizards to perform the magic needed to avert a government computer c catastrophe in 2000. Catastrophe. And then, yeah, a yeah. catastrophe. And again, from The Economist magazine, The Millennium Bug. The Economist suggests, why fix the Millennium Bug at all? Let the computers make it 1900 again. But use the wisdom that has been so bitterly acquired to get the 20th century right this time around. Well, how in the world does all this connect with end time events, Jack? First of all, I want to repeat a verse Daniel 12, 4, which says, At the time of the end, knowledge shall be increased. It's here. Do you know we only had 50,000 computers 25 years ago, and now we have 141 million, and they tell us it'll go to three or 400 million in the next 10 years? What can be done with so many high-powered computers? 
keeping track of the entire human race may now be possible. Take a look. We've all seen this. A radiologist analyzing an x-ray or CAT scan to see what ails a patient. And although peering inside the body without surgery is among the real miracles of modern medicine. Right now, everything um, for medical imaging and maintenance of x-ray films is handled manually, essentially. Medical film libraries contain thousands of x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, and other images. Locating a specific image can take considerable effort, and in an emergency, time is critical. If they're not digitally accessible, then you have to have a person physically go to the library, pull the film, get them to you, and even in a best case scenario, it takes 15, 20 minutes. By that time, critical time may have been passed already. And that's why the ability to store and retrieve medical images on computers would be a major breakthrough. So, why isn't it done that way already? Well, one reason is because it would require a hospital to store massive amounts of digital data each and every year in the neighborhood of the combined disk space of 4,000 of today's home computers. Another problem is the need for high-speed access to that data, and no one has developed a total solution until now. The Medical College of Virginia Hospitals and IBM's Digital Library are developing new technology that could literally change how doctors around the world take care of you. Essentially, all of the x-rays that you see here on these two carts are going to wind up here on this one 33 gigabyte tape. We're going to use this new digital imaging system technology to move the images to where the radiologists are while we serve the patients in a convenient location. Therefore, we could hopefully enhance the care of those patients through the interpretation of those images without those patients ever coming near the medical center. I not only have their, their images available immediately, I have their whole past history of imaging available very quickly. I can envision the time when you uh, have a unique identifier number for a patient and that person arrives uh, and within seconds you can pull up their entire medical record start life-saving treatment on them uh, without wasting any time. And uh, that's why I think it's the future of medicine, not just radiology. If you can get treated faster, you can get better faster, uh, you can get back to work faster, that's good for your employer. Uh, and if we can uh, use a digital imaging system technology to reduce cost, then your uh, premiums for health care will be less, or your employer's premiums for health care will be less. Uh, that'll be good for everyone. The efficiencies to be gained uh, from a digital imaging system revolve around the fact that much of our information is shared. The images are a resource for many decision makers, physicians, and the system. Digital imaging is the future of radiology and it's, it is the future of medicine. Ultimately, the digital library will also give doctors the ability to conduct high-speed clinical research that wasn't possible until now. There are other reasons, besides medical, to have a unique identifying number and a detailed file on everyone. As seen from the past news report, computers are now able to handle vast amounts of information. But how close are we to actually implementing such a tracking system? We have talked uh, in 1996 about the implantable ID, locators for convenience and security and buying and selling. And on the cover of the Chicago Tribune, we have here, in the future, tiny chip may get under your skin. A tiny chip implanted inside the human body to send and receive radio messages along a popular delusion among paranoids is likely now to be marketed as a consumer item early in the next century. Let me go on here. Oh, this is powerful. They've got to get it. The Chicago Tribune. Yes, the Chicago Tribune. Several systems already are in place with the potential to locate people with uh, using radio signals. Now, you know, if you have this implantation, they can locate you anywhere. People accept that increased communications make life more convenient at the same time. It means there's no hiding place anymore, said Bernard Beck, a Northwestern University sociologist. Cornish believes, at least initially, that such chips would be voluntary. But he acknowledges that things that are voluntary today have a way of becoming compulsory tomorrow. And so this may be something that will be asked of every human being to uh, to have a jacket oh, one time or another. They will lose their lives if they don't take it in the future, Revelation 13, 15, and Revelation 20, verse 4. And it's described in Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. He, this leader that comes out of this European Union, out of this revived Roman Empire, causes everyone to receive a mark. 
in their right hand or forehead, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here's wisdom. Let him that understanding counts the number of the beast, for it's a number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six, 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 six. You've just heard it. They have several systems in place, and it's going to happen after the Church of Jesus Christ has been evacuated. Just to stress how far we have come and how close we are to the mark of the beast, here's a look at another powerful new technology and another reason for keeping detailed records on everyone. Putting more police on the streets is one way to help win the battle against crime. And the state of Maryland is doing just that, but not by hiring more officers. Rather, it is accomplishing this through a new arrest booking system and the innovative use of network technology solutions. In its first year of operation in the Baltimore Central Booking and Intake Center, the unique system is credited with returning more than 160 officers to police duty in Baltimore neighborhoods. The goal is collapsing nine districts into one centralized area. The goal is speed. The goal is to give up turf and to do team building. So we developed a partnership, a very strong partnership. That partnership dealt with public safety, corrections, the numerous police departments in this geographical area, the courts, the public defenders, the state's attorney, and our data partner, IBM. We do a booking process that's faster and I would put up against anything in this country. We identify people faster than anybody in this country does, and we put 162 more police officers out in the street. That saves the public money and it saves lives. That's what we do. Police officers bring arrested offenders to the booking center. The officers spend about an hour or less preparing statements of probable cause and charges before returning to duty. A bar-coated band is placed on the wrist of offenders. This band is scanned as they pass through the booking process. The information is immediately transmitted to the IBM computer network, where it is stored for later use. Next, to help positively identify the offender, fingerprints are captured digitally with a live scanned fingerprint system. The prints and information captured are transmitted electronically via the network to the Maryland Automated Fingerprint Identification Center. The prints are compared to the statewide fingerprint file for matches with outstanding warrants and for prints retrieved at unsolved crime sites. Positive matching of prints is reported back to the booking facility in less than an hour. The network also automatically retrieves criminal records and sends them electronically to court administrators and pretrial investigators. Since the opening of Central Booking in Baltimore, this network technology solution has matched over 7,000 offenders with outstanding warrants and has also solved 2,500 crimes previously classified as unsolved. By linking the centralized fingerprint file and the arrest booking process, the IBM network will dramatically decrease the rate of unsolved crimes. We had an individual that was arrested by the Maryland State Police uh, at one of our local shopping malls. He was brought to our central booking unit where we did a fingerprint analysis of the individual. Within 29 minutes, we had a positive identification of the individual. Uh, the positive identification revealed to us that he had nine outstanding criminal warrants, one being a felony warrant from a, another state. When we went to this individual and, and we told him, we identified him by his real name, uh, and he hung his head down and he came back up and he said, wow, the technology really works. After fingerprinting, digitized mug shots are taken and stored by the network for lineups, wanted posters, and verification of identity at the time of release. All data captured within the network during the booking process is immediately available to pretrial investigators who use it to prepare bail recommendations. It also is available to defense attorneys, court administrators, and judges. The network technology also streamlines bail hearings. Hearings are now held in the booking facility by video conference, eliminating the need to transfer offenders to district courthouses and allowing judges to access all relevant information from the network. The central booking network technology solution has become so successful in ensuring public safety that it was expanded to other counties in Maryland. So, in the fight against crime, how effective is this network technology? This system 
will do as much for law enforcement in the next 10 years as 911 did for law enforcement 30 years ago. It's here, it works, and it's a reality. Digital fingerprinting technology already exists, yet some people may still doubt whether a mark of the beast type system would be viable in society. In response to that, take a look at this commercial. 374-90042. Account code. 963-400. Key code. Since the last thing you need is one more number to remember, MasterCard is developing the single digit PIN code. Someday a computer chip in your card will recognize your unique mark. So your personal identification code is personal. It's how the future will be paid for. MasterCard, it's smart money. Still not convinced? We recently interviewed David Chong, president of DigiCash. Listen to what his company is working on and marketing. But the, the scope of the project is really intended to encompass all kinds of credentials and uh, uh, everything from medical to uh, driver's license and uh, the, the whole range of sort of the idea is that everything that you have in your wallet today would be replaced by some kind of electronic form. So another name for the CAFE project is Electronic Wallet Project. So it is clear that the mark of the beast technology is near and that knowledge of all sorts is definitely increasing. But what other signs regarding Daniel's prophecy are there? And what makes them all so significant at this particular time in history? You know, Jack, in this day of the internet and multimedia, oftentimes we've forgotten about the radio, but they're going to do great things with the radio in our space programs. World Space to send up radio to the stars. In fact, I'd like to read that whole article. It's very interesting. The rocket refueling station on the moon might be in the future. And then NASA's Galileo spacecraft swooped within 524 miles of the solar system's largest moon, Jupiter's Ganymede. And again, robots gear up to invade Mars. We've been talking so very, very much about Mars, but listen to this from the Associated Press. Most remote galaxy is detected. Astronomers say they found the most distant galaxy ever detected, 14 billion light years away. I cannot even imagine the distances that I'm saying right now, and, and I'm sure it's difficult for you too. But Jack, do you feel that these are some more signs that tell us that the Lord is coming back soon? Tremendous signs. For all you say, folks who say, oh, Grandma used to talk about these things, nothing has changed, listen carefully. I've used this quote a few times this year, but it's so powerful, I want to reuse it. Pope Pius XII, on Easter Sunday, 1957, said, in his address in the Vatican, there's only one more thing that has to happen, and the countdown to Christ's return begins. What was that thing? He never lived to see it, for it happened 10 years later in 1967 during the June 5th through 10th war when the Jews took Jerusalem. Now, why is that important? Because no other sign meant anything until that happened. Jesus said in Luke 21, 24, when my people take Jerusalem, 1967, and you see signs in the sun, moon, star, and planets. And here is a man walking on the moon in July of 1969, 25 months later. Then what? Verse 28, when these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Verse 31, when these things come to pass, you know the kingdom of God is nigh, close at hand. So the increase in knowledge that we see in this generation fits in perfectly with the prophecy that the Jews would return to Israel. And this exponential increase also comes at a time when another end times prophecy is suddenly possible. And I'm reading from Time magazine. CNN gives everyone the same information at the same moment. That change in communication has in turn affected intelligence gathering. Now, the minute anything happens, they all run to CNN and think the whole world is sharing this experience with me. Well, you, you know, Jack, uh, that is very true. When something happens, the whole world knows about it. Yeah, even yeah. Saddam Hussein said he watched the news daily to see what was happening. But you know that CNN and others that are following their way of gathering the news and showing it simultaneously to the whole world are a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This could never have happened, the thing I'm about to describe, until our lifetime, and it's the return of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Revelation 1-7 says, when he comes, 
every eye shall see him. CNN can do that. These news agencies will be able to soon do that, many of them. And what they'll see is Christ coming regally and royally on that white horse in Revelation 19, 11. The armies of heaven following him. That's the saints who are raptured, now returning. He comes as King of kings, and the Lord of lords, verse 16, to rule and reign for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. And again, Rexella, during that seven-year period of tribulation, there are two witnesses ministering upon the earth. They've returned. could be Moses and Elias. It could be Enoch and Elias. We're not sure which two out of the three. But as they're standing on the earth, they are preaching against the sins of the people. Undoubtedly, the sins mentioned in Revelation 9, verses 20 and 21. It says, They repented not of the works of their hands that they should worship demons, these fallen angels, these spirits that uh, we're talking about on our new video. And also, Rexella, they would not repent of their murders, their pharmacias, drug abuses, their fornications, sexual impurities, and thefts. And so they're really telling the world what's wrong. And the world hates their preaching and kills these two witnesses in verse 7. And verse 9 says that every person all people, kindreds, tongues, and nations see their dead bodies lying on the street. CNN can do that. Hmm. And then something miraculous happens in verses 11 and 12. The Lord raises them back from the dead and says, Come up hither. There's that expression again, same as Revelation 4.1. And it says that all their enemies beheld them. Those who had put them to death now see them whizzing through space to go to be with the Lord. Every eye sees Christ coming, and every eye sees these two witnesses, both at the time they're put to death and their bodies lying in the streets, and when they're taken up to be with the Lord. That's one of the great signs, what's happening now, as we can all see everything simultaneously. Mm -hmm. He's coming. The world with CNN and worldwide television, for the first time in history, could watch the death of these men, could watch their bodies unburied, and be aware of it, have a party, and then be astonished as they arose supernaturally in the sight of all men. These prophecies could not be fulfilled in any other generation. For certain, Daniel's prophecy 2,500 years ago is coming true today. Through super planes, supercomputers, the internet, virtual reality, implantable microchips, and the global mass media, knowledge really is being increased. But what does all of this mean? Every day we are bombarded with the news of another new discovery. But how can we tell what's really important? We'll leave you with this message from the Van Impius. Well, you know, today we are being saturated with news. As you see on the cover of Time magazine, print, cable, the internet, we're being bombarded by information, gossip, and commentary as never before is more news. Good news. There you have the news war. And I would ask Jack that. Uh, we're going to be giving you some news today. Is more news good news? Ours is good news. Right, and Jack? I'll tell you why. <laughs> because the term gospel means good news. When Christ came the first time, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news. What is it, Paul, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul said in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news about Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. But he's coming again. And there's more good news. The Bible tells us that 144,000 flaming Jewish evangelists, Revelation 7, verses 4 to 8, are going to be preaching globally, Mashiach, Messiah, is coming. Where is that? Matthew 24, 14. The gospel, the good news of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world. What is that good news? That the king is going to return. That prayer is going to be answered. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 10. And oh, I'll tell you, it's exciting to be alive in this day and age. And you know, I mentioned this three weeks ago, and perhaps you didn't hear it. But I had heard that Pope John Paul II believed that Christ's coming was near. And you know, on May 29th of 1996, he declared the year of Jubilee for 2000. Preparations are being made, but 
I get his paper, La Zavritori Romano, the Roman Observer. It's been the paper of the popes for 150 years. In it are all of his sermons. Now get it. On December 5th and December 15th of last year, the headlines blared across the page. Christ is about to return. Get ready. And that's the gospel, the good news of his second coming. Look at me and pray it. Lord Jesus, I want to get ready. I receive you today. I want to be prepared. You died for me. And I accept what you did into my heart. Amen.